We are going to talk tonight about the social networks, the good and the bad and the ugly side and all of that. Um, and who, which, in which country um, are the most active in use of social networks? Anybody know? Hard to hazard a guess? Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, no. America? No, it's China. And not many people actually realize that. The Chinese have twice as many people using the internet as in the United States. Part of that's a factor of population, of course. But there are 300 million people in China who use the equivalent of Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And in fact, uh, the Chinese were ahead of twi with Twitter. They were tweeting on their own uh, network, was called something else, long before the Americans really adopted Twitter. Uh, and the Chinese use it extremely effectively um, all the time. Now, you haven't come here to hear me because we've got some distinguished um, speakers, but I just wanted to say that by introduction. We're going to talk about the social networks, about how they're used in politics by ma many countries and many governments, uh, and how they're used against politicians or against business, and what business and the politicians can do and do do to defend themselves against it. And we have two people who are going to talk with you tonight. One from the United States, Joe Trippi. Joe Trippi is uh, one of the pioneers of the use of social networks in political campaigns. And he's used them very successfully. <coughs> and uh, uh, Nicholas Wright, one of our council members, has been talking to him and we have recorded that interview. We're going to show you that. And then we have Greg Daniel AM, who founded a company in Sydney called SR7, which has clients the world over, who are who he's helping deal with some of the impact of social <coughs> networks. For example, if um, you're trying to develop coal seam gas internationally and in Australia, there's a huge international campaign using the social networks run by environmentalists and the Greens against it. Um, and so um, these people need help and advice. And so we're going to hear two sides of this argument. And first of all, we're going to hear from Joe Trippi, and I'm going to ask Nick Wright, if you wouldn't mind, just to kindly introduce him, because Nick talked to him at the weekend. It's currently 4.30 a.m. in Washington, D.C., so uh, Joe Trippi's enthusiasm for making use of the latest internet technology to pre-record his contribution is perhaps understandable. Um, Joe is one of the top operatives in Democrat and global politics today. Um, going back to Ted Kennedy in 1980, he's been directing frontline presidential campaigns for over 30 years, and we're very fortunate to, to have his contribution this evening. Um, in 2004, he took an obscure Vermont governor, Howard Dean, from the fringes of the primaries to a fundraising behemoth. He out-fundraised out uh, John Kerry and George W. Bush on the way to coming within a whisker of the Iowa caucus and the New Hampshire primary. But it's much more interesting than, uh, than a story about money. His pioneering use of social media, blogs, and internet participation uh, was taken on and exploited to dramatic effect by Barack Obama and the people who were with him when he captured the White House in, in 2008. Um, his book is called The Revolution Will Not Be Televised and it's still available in all good bookstores. Uh, the central argument is that the, the internet would transform global politics, returning it to a golden era of localised engagement and decentralised participation. And there was a dramatic illustration of that in the Middle East uh, that we all know about um, last year at, at this. Um, so I started by asking him to sketch out how much the world had changed in the eight years since the Howard Dean for America campaign in 2004. First, want to say uh, thank you for having me with you tonight. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't uh, have been uh, in your uh, beautiful country in, in, in person. I, I would, would have far more enjoyed that. However, uh, look, the, on the, the, the whole thing about how fast things are moving, had you sat me down the day after the Dean campaign was over and asked me 
uh, what 2008 would look like. Um, it would have, you would have had to have imagined in 2004, there was no YouTube, there was no Twitter, there were only, um, uh, Facebook was only on two uh, college campuses. It had not, uh, not uh, uh, been, you know, wasn't out there with millions and millions of people. Um, to give you an idea of how fast things changed just between Howard Dean and Barack Obama, the day the Howard Dean campaign was over, there were 1.4 million blogs in the world. The day that Barack Obama started his campaign, there were 77 million blogs in the world. So by you know almost a factor of 70 uh, in just four short years, uh, actually three years, um, that all changed. When Ob how fast things have changed or big, big they've changed since then, um, Barack Obama had 110,000 Twitter followers uh, the day his campaign ended in 2008. Today he's got over 15 million. So there's two things that are happening. One is the, you know, uh, James Carville, who uh, was the mastermind of the, the Clinton campaigns, used to say it's the economy, stupid. It's, um, I, I say it's the, it's the network, stupid. It, the network is getting larger, more people uh, are, throughout the United States and globally are getting on the network every day. They have more broadband, more ability to consume video, and the, uh, the tools on the network, it's not just more people, but the tools that are on the network, uh, the applications, the tools that, that are at people's disposal and the campaign's disposal are much more powerful than they were in 2004, 2008. So you have this powerful growing network with far more powerful tools, and it's changing everything, not just politics, but I think it's having effect on journalism, on corporations. And we had an interesting case just last week when the U.S. Supreme Court upheld Obamacare, and the reporting by social networks was more accurate than that of the news networks. Well, look, look uh, you are seeing with uh, the Supreme Court ruling with, uh, with different things that uh, how fast um, uh, the uh, social media uh, is it moving information and, 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 and actually how badly in some, time, in some cases the, the, what we know as the mainstream media um, get it wrong. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the reporters uh, who were reading the, uh, the uh, uh, ruling uh, thought that the law had been uh, thrown out and, uh, and, re and, and reported that. Um, so, and it was, uh, and that, some of that was spread quickly through social media and confu confused both sides. But in the end, um, you have millions of people uh, who are moving information and, and I think uh, in a lot of, uh, very often scooping the mainstream media or moving a message, moving uh, a narrative uh, much, much quicker and, and with much more impact um, than, than, than some of the main networks. I, I, one of the things that's going on here is the individual power now in, in a person's hands. I mean, if four of your friends email you or text you uh, that the new movie is horrible, that it was a waste of money, they went and saw it over the weekend, and, you know, don't go, um, it no longer matters how many millions of dollars the movie studio spends on television ads and posters telling you it'll be the greatest movie you ever, you've ever gone to, you're not going to go. That same thing is happening with campaigns, with governments, uh, where the campaign, you know, a, a, a TV ad by the Barack Obama's campaign doesn't have as much effect on his supporters as messages coming from, friend, from your friends uh, who support him urging you to, to take a look at him or, or, or to vote for him. That's what happened in 2008, and we're seeing it even stronger and having an impact on journalism as well. Now, you wrote a book, The Revolution Won't Be Televised, and we saw this emphasized with the Arab Spring, where social networks sparked revolutions that were only televised later on when the crowds took to the streets. I said that the movement, uh, that what was happening with online, with social networks, with the Internet, um, uh, and the power that was moving into people's ha hands at the bottom uh, with voters and, and, and citizens uh, 
wasn't going to, you know, didn't recognize borders. It was going to leap out of the United States and leap around uh, the country, other countries, and we would have uh, people rising up and using it to communicate, uh, to gather together, and to change uh, uh, and to change uh, uh, their government if they if they didn't agree with it, uh, or or to you know to build a democracy uh, if they didn't have one. And so I wasn't. Um, you know, that surprised at all. Um, I think uh, part of the problem is, is understanding that, you know, that, that, that just because people have, can vote and have a democracy doesn't mean that they're not going to go through a lot of the problems that we in the United States went through. We didn't, you know, women didn't have the right to vote. African Americans weren't equal and did not have uh, the right to vote. Those took years and years in a Supreme Court rulings and a civil war. Um, so democracy doesn't solve all the problems. Uh, I think the Arab Spring uh, is bringing democracy to, to many of those countries, but uh, those countries have a lot of, uh, I, I, you know, disruption in front of them. Um, people forget, you know, it wasn't all that easy in the United States to get to where we are today. Yes, but it's fair to ask whether social media is really a force for democracy. Isn't politics still controlled by the same elite? Well, that's certainly one of the, the things that's happening is, you know, in the, here in the States, we, uh, you know, Barack Obama raised a half a billion dollars, uh, $500 million from individuals who gave $25, $10, $15 over the Internet. Uh, about 3 million people gave him that money. Uh, the Republican response was not to say, let's go build a, uh, an online community of small donors to give to us. Their, their response was to uh, uh, create super PACs uh, where millionaires and, and the wealthy could give large, I mean, very large amounts of money, uh, all because they feared this grassroots funding uh, mechanism that had been developed by Dean and, 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 uh, and developed it much further by, a, by, uh, by, by Barack Obama. Um, what, I, what I say to people is it's about Goliath and armies of Davids, and the Internet allows armies of Davids to gather together and take on Goliath. And the company that understood that was Apple, because the recording industry was Goliath. People wanted to not have to buy the whole album to get the one song that was any good. Um, and Apple said, we'll give you slingshots. We're not going to be Goliath. Now they, they're, they've grown, they're the biggest company in the world right now. But that wasn't, the, the, the idea was, how do we give the Army of Davids slingshots? And let's go slay, let them go take on Goliath. And the recording industry isn't so big anymore, isn't, as, isn't powerful enough to tell us how we're going to consume our music. The company that hands out slingshots is now the number one company, the biggest company in the world. And the Army of Davids is getting the music they want. And I think that's what a, a very important lesson for parties and corporations and, and governments is how do you use, use the technology to empower the people, whether it's empower them to have more choice in their music, empower them to, have, uh, to be more involved in the party um, or in their country's uh, future or in the policies, in building the policies that, that, that will build the future. And what do you think we in Australia can learn from all this? Uh, well, I mean, the biggest one is start now. If you're going to, you can build a movement, uh, a huge movement. Uh, you know, the Dean campaign, there were 431 people in the United States who, who were supporting him, 431. And we started building that group and urging them to talk to their friends, to get people to sign up, to go to the website, to come onto the blog, uh, to email their friends. And within three months, we were at 159,000 people. We raised more money. Um, at that point, we broke Bill Clinton's record that he set uh, when he uh, ran for re-election for president, not when he ran for president, when he ran for re-election. So he raised it as, we broke his record as the sitting president of the United States. And we uh, kept growing to 650,000 people. And the biggest lesson I learned through all of it was I wish we had started a few just a few months earlier and we would have gotten to a few million more. So I think look if you 
if you've got, um, uh, if you're trying to, to build an influential community that can affect change and move uh, your issue, your policy, your company, your brand, or your country, or your political party forward, it's start to build it now online. Build the soul. It is the network, stupid. Now, we're running out of time, but I really can't resist asking you, how's the presidential race going? Who's going to win? This year, it's going to be very close, and it's probably going to come down to three or four states. Um, Ohio, Florida, Virginia are all three states that uh, Romney must win uh, to have any chance of the presidency. Uh, Obama starts with a huge lead in the electoral vote uh, against Romney. Um, and is only 27 or 30 votes away. There's only a, he only needs a few state uh, to come into his column that are toss-ups out of the 11 or so uh, that are out there. So uh, that's one. The second thing is Romney has developed a huge problem with two groups, Latinos, Hispanics, um, and women. And you cannot win most of these states, particularly in the West, uh, Western United States, with, which has a large Hispanic population, you might be able to win some of those states uh, if Hispanics were the only group you were losing. But if you're losing them and women, you can't win those states. So my, I really, uh, I'm not speaking as a partisan here. Uh, I really believe that Romney has a huge uphill road to climb. Joe Trippi, thanks very much for being with the AIIA this evening. Thanks for having me, Nick. Really, it's, uh, it was great to be with you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Great pleasure to be here. And a uh, great thrill for me to see that interview with uh, Dan Trippi. Uh, I've been a follower of his exploits uh, politically and in social networks in particular uh, since the uh, famous Howard Dean campaign. I was always intrigued by uh, how quickly it grew, uh, but then how quickly it collapsed. Um, a moment in uh, living history, for those of you who remember how Dean's famous scream, which basically ended his campaign. Um, I, uh, one thing will be pretty obvious to you, uh, I'm not uh, a generation Y. <laughs> um, but I, I, I've said before I'm, I'm kind of generation X and the X is for experience and I think um, a little bit of experience helps uh, when it comes to uh, mediums like social media um, you will find that uh, if you look back to history uh, when new mediums develop um, there are always uh, groups of people who are utopian about their effects. And uh, we call these people cyber-utopians when it comes to uh, social media, uh, because there are a group of people, a strong group of people, uh, who believe that every single thing that happens on social media is absolutely wonderful. And it will, uh, it will cure all the ills of the world, it will tear down barriers, it will do many, many good things. And I'm sure, and I know, it is capable of doing many Things. But there's another side to social media as well, and that's where people like me can do into the equation. Cyber cons, cyber conservatives, who see that um, the power of good that social media can bring uh, can also be a, a source of uh, disruption and disquiet. So, <clears throat> just so you understand, a uh, company that I run, SR7, co founded, is a social media intelligence company. And in its rawest form, it grew out of an observation that uh, government and the corporate community were being very ill-served by the amount of uh, thoroughgoing analysis that was available to them across material that was appearing on all of these social media platforms. And I do mean all of them, the Twitters, the blogs, the Facebooks, etc., etc. So we were particularly seeing companies and organizations that were having their uh, reputations badly damaged by not understanding what was already sitting out there on the social media platforms. So that became 
uh, for us the very first entry point into this into this world. Now I've been a long-term investor in, in uh, various internet and social media developments over quite some time, um, but the growth of uh, the need for uh, organisations to have a comprehensive understanding of what was being said about them was something that to me was a very apparent need that could be fulfilled. Uh, the company has grown, as Colin said, quite strongly since then. We, we, we have uh, strategic alliances globally with Aon, who are the world's largest risk management group, and also with uh, KPMG. And we work across a whole variety of, uh, of exercises for these people. And I'll touch on a few of those as we go through, which will probably flesh out a little bit of what um, Joe Trippi was talking about. Um, what, what companies face um, in, a, in, a, in a social media problem is something he touched on, and that is speed, it is virality. It is the fact that we used to have what was called a 24-hour news cycle, and we have now what I call a 24-second opinion cycle. How much of news, real news, is out there, as Joe said, is accurate news anymore, is a bit up for question. If you actually look at the average size um, news department uh, inside a, uh, an organisation like uh, News Limited or Fairfax or any of the television stations or traditional media, you'll find generally in the last 10 years those departments have shrunk by 50%. So you've got less and less people writing more and more stories. Where do they go for their information? Where do they go for their research? They actually go to social media. You would be surprised uh, to know how many stories are actually sourced from social media that appear in newspapers and on television and where the research is actually coming from. So all of this is now developing in, into a, a, a way of communicating that both individuals, uh, companies and governments really have to start uh, seriously beginning to tackle. Uh, I can honestly say, because uh, I've spoken <coughs> at conferences around the world on this subject, that Australia is no more advanced or less advanced than just about every other country. The problems that governments face in dealing with social media, the problems that corporations face in dealing with social media, the problems that individuals face in dealing with social media are basically the same all over the world. Um, you do have a difference when it gets to places like China, uh, which obviously have a very uh, authoritarian view of how social media should be used. But you've also seen how authoritarian regimes uh, have failed to control social media and shutting down debate. So, so you get the good side sometimes when you have the Arab Spring. You get the bad side sometimes when you face with the London riots, where social media was used as a tool by the groups of hoodlums, basically, uh, that are, in my view, a lot of social nonsense has been wrapped around since, but people who just saw an opportunity to run up and use social media as a means of um, perpetrating crime. Now, in, uh, in this country uh, and in other countries around the world, various departments, police departments, are only now beginning to understand that um, a lot of crime is organised on social media. This is used, it's a primary tool for perpetrating crime. So <clears throat> I'm just trying to spelling this out for you so you've got this balance, a more balanced view perhaps of the, the dark side of the force and the light side of the force. They are both there uh, and both uh, capable of being used for one purpose or another. When it comes to um, something that Colin touched on, uh, which is issues-driven subjects. This is an area where social media has become 
a new battleground. It was described to me in exactly those terms two weeks ago by the chairman of one of the largest uh, energy companies in this country. And he admitted that they had lost the battle. This is on the coal seam gas issue. They had not recognized until 18 months down the track that the way they were focusing their attention through the traditional media, through the lobbying, through all the things that they had traditionally done to, to, to make their point of view prevail, <coughs> had been absolutely and totally in vain because the battle was actually going on, on, on across social media platforms. And they weren't paying attention to it. They saw it as peripheral. It was actually where the real fight was taking place. And this is the area that, that we get involved in quite a bit, quite a lot. Um, and, and, and quite frankly, I see it as an absolute necessity for good corporate governance. Um, ideas can be hijacked on social media. They can be uh, warped on social media. And, and those views then, because of the new cycle I was talking about before, translate automatically to traditional media. So they are all compounding one another. So you can find a situation <clears throat> where a, a, a small, a very small minority um, may have a very strong point of view. They will gain a dis disproportionate share of uh, arguments via social media platforms and the entire debate will be skewed from that point on. Unless, two things. First of all, that the corporation or government department or whatever it may be, fully understands the depth of the debate that is going on across social media platforms. Understands not only how many people are saying things, who's saying these things? Why are they, they saying these things? What is the agenda behind them? Are they actually gaining real traction? Are they gaining real followers? Or are they just making more noise? And that noise itself is having an effect on policy makers because these people are telling them where they're making all those noise. So a lot of our jobs often at, 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 my, at my company are helping <clears throat> uh, departments and, and companies understand exactly who is saying this, why are they saying it? How much impact does it have? How much impact does it really have? How many followers is this strain of thought really attracting? And one of the wonderful things about social media as a, as, as a, as a tool to understand debate is you can actually see in real time how many people are taking up this argument. You can also see quite quickly how many people, without, without any uh, Sort of instigation at all, just voluntarily are putting a different point of view. I mean, social media from that point of view can be incredibly democratic. People forget that the moment you put something out there on social media, you are asking for a response, and very often you're going to get it. The responses, though, can often be very uncoordinated, and this is where groups like Get Up and, and Greenpeace uh, uh, are extremely skillful. They mobilize very quickly, uh, very disciplined, they have an agenda, and they push that agenda out. The reaction to them can be quite spasmodic, and therefore quite ineffective. So part of our job is once we, once we really understand what are the parameters of a debate on social media, uh, how much of it is real uh, information that is driving debate, how much is just noise, then our clients can start joining in that debate. They can start creating a dialogue with those specific groups and say, hang on a minute, that, what you're saying is actually factually untrue. These are the facts. And once you do that on social media, the wonderful thing is that people are suckers for the truth. And they actually start coming in there and go, well, you know, that's right, I've thought that too. And that's when you begin to understand that you have the ability to start moving that debate back into a more balanced framework. One thing you learn in social media very quickly is if you vacate the battlefield, other people will fill it. 
This happened uh, to Nestle in a huge way a couple of years ago. Cost the company several hundred million dollars. Campaign was run against them by uh, Greenpeace about their palm oil um, methodologies. And uh, it took Nestle completely by surprise. Uh, they didn't know how to respond. Uh, they responded badly. And then when they did respond badly and they were pulverized even more, they then vacated the field. He said nothing. And that void was filled by the most extreme views about Nestle and corporations generally. The campaign was so successful that Greenpeace <clears throat> went public with it and gave an interview to Forbes magazine of all, you know, the capitalist tool as it called it itself, but gave it, uh, an interview to Forbes saying, we now know what the weak underbelly of the corporate world is. It's social media. This is our template. So from that point on, several years ago, you've seen groups like Get Up in Australia wage campaigns against the banks, against the mining companies, against anybody that they don't like at any particular given time. So it is quite incumbent on those companies and quite incumbent on government to have a sound strategic response. And that's some of the work we do. Um, the law has been slow in this area. Government has been slow in this area, although I'd encourage you if you're interested. There is a paper that was published um, about a month ago by the Demos Institute in the UK on social media intelligence. It's probably one of the best pieces I've read about this particular topic. And uh, I, would, I would encourage any of you who are, who are interested in this to, to read it. But one thing it really does reveal is that we are all at the beginning of understanding this, this phenomenon uh, and this cycle. Another thing that uh, would probably be of interest to you just to show how quickly the world is changing in this regard, a study was released only yesterday in the United States, a joint study between uh, Deloitte and Forbes on risk, the nature of risk, and how corporations view risk. They interviewed a large number of people, chief executives, chief financial officers, uh, of companies that have revenues of between $5 billion and $20 billion a year. 27% of those executives nominated social media risk as their number one risk. 12 months ago, not one of those people nominated social media risk as a major risk to their brand corporation. The world is changing very, very quickly. And um, the company that I work with, Aon, uh, is at the forefront of, of, of helping clients manage risk, their political risk, environmental risk, social media risk, in all parts of the, uh, all parts of the world. So I guess that's an overview, Colin, of, of what we do and how we, we do it. Well, uh, for a start, we're, we're, not a, a, we're not in that business. I mean, we're not in the PR and marketing business. Um, we're in the business of risk analysis. Um, we often work side by side with communications departments inside government or inside uh, corporations. Um, and, uh, and, and we are often asked by marketers to evaluate their, their campaigns and see how effective they are actually proving to be on across social media platforms. <coughs> Not so much the campaigns themselves, but what, how people are responding to them. So our work is really in the analysis and, uh, and research and intelligence area. It's not in the PR area. There are many people out there. I mean, to a large degree, um, social media as a business tool uh, has been hijacked by uh, the marketing industry and the PR industry with good reason. Um, because traditional media usage is falling off rapidly. I'll, I'll come back to that. So commercially savvy people involved in ad agencies and PR companies, and et cetera, are looking for a new way to communicate with consumers. And what has been going on in that landscape for 20 years has been an increasing 
segmentation and fragmentation of markets. So the, the whole concept of television advertising, the whole concept of mass media advertising has become quite redundant because it's based around the whole concept of mass markets. And there are fewer and fewer mass markets now in, in, in advanced society. There are just masses of micro markets. And the usage of social media is a, is a pure example of that, it's empowering individuals to do things their own way and niche and tweak. And, so PR companies and marketers and ad agencies have been have pounced on this as a as a as a way of, of communicating, but um, that's really not our our task. Just to show you though the bind that they're in, there was some research done by Nielsen uh, that clearly showed that advertising on social media platforms. Uh, could possibly influence 16% of people in a particular direction. But 84% of people are influenced by what other people tell them on social media. So this, there is a major commercial tipping point, in my view, happening in that whole game. And you've just seen people like Kev, you know, James Packer. That's why James Packer sold out of his you know, traditional media assets. Uh, and why you saw John Fairfax do what it's done. Uh, you know, the, everybody is looking for the way to, to use social media as a communications tool and monetize it. Um, whether they will or whether they won't, I'm not sure, but uh, that's not our, our task. A few, we, a few days ago, last week in Sichuan province in China, um, the residents of a city there were very upset about the plan to build a big industrial new plant there because it was uh, environmentally toxic. And uh, if you've been to some of these regional um, Chinese cities, you'll understand why people are getting more and more upset about the environment. Um, it's hard to breathe in some of them. So they took to the streets and protest, and the local um, powers that be, the local authorities in Sichuan province, sent in the police big time. And there were some very violent clashes and battles. <coughs> and then suddenly they stopped. Beijing actually put the call through to um, the local uh, provincial government and said, no, no, you can't take these people on. We don't want another Tiananmen Square. Thank you very much. Well, we've got a transfer of the leadership <coughs> coming up at the end of the year. Um, cancel this plant. In other words, the social, and, the, and this story was spread throughout the province and throughout the city by the social networks. So uh, in this case, the social networks were instrumental in stopping this. Now, um, time was when they would have tried to shut down the social network. But in this case, they couldn't. But there is an army of people, there are tens of thousands of people who work for the Ministry of Information in Beijing who are actually monitoring and trying to censor their equivalent of Facebook and their equivalent of Twitter. And there's a lot of censorship going on. For example, um, discussion of the one child policy and the num increased number of abortions uh, uh, amongst women who don't want girls is is rather banned by the by the authorities. Um, but now, um, an organisation in Hong Kong, uh, part of Hong Kong University, has devised some very clever software which analyses what is banned by the government and what isn't. And has now produced a huge website from which you can go on and read, and you can see the areas where the Beijing authorities crack down, for example, uh, any criticism of the Communist Party is completely out, not tolerated, and areas such as this one which are marginal, and areas where, frankly, there's very free public discussion on the social networks. Um, and this is in China, which, as I said, is the biggest single user of these networks now, uh, which not many people realize. I think that is, that is, that is symptomatic of, of how government is, is, even authoritarian government is now having to adapt itself 
to the new reality of social media and the power that uh, it can have. And the power is really tied up in, in those things I said before. And it's tied up in speed, the virality. How do you contain that information when it's, it's available to so many people in such a short space of time? So even the most authoritarian regime is going to really grapple hard to, to, to solve that one. And the other one is the, the power of the individual. The fact that people are now empowered to speak out, they are empowered to share their view, and there is precious little that can be done to stop them doing it. Well, well, you are right. I mean, it is a data chain effect. Um, because in, in essence, in essence, what is social media? It's a conversation, you know? Everybody, everybody, when, when I was growing up, and when all of you were growing up, there was a, a great, people always said this, they always said the best form of advertising is word of mouth. So what is social, what are social networks? <coughs> people talking about it, basically. So it's just this massive conversation. So you're right, I mean, just because a group of people speak on Facebook doesn't mean that people who aren't on Facebook aren't going to be affected by that conversation because it will get reported. It will get reported you know, around the water cooler. It will get reported in the coffee shop. It will get reported you know, on traditional media. So the, the, the ongoing, the knock-on effect of, all, of, all, of these technologies is, is, is vast. And it's vast and it's quick. I mean, I, I can't keep coming back to this enough. <coughs> when, when governments particularly, which are generally pretty slow moving pieces, and government departments, which are even slow moving <coughs> pieces, are trying to communicate a new policy, or they're trying to find out what people really think about things. The speed with which these things are running away from them always makes, I think this is a bigger, a bigger issue about the relevance of government, um, I, I'm working with ANZOR, which is the Australian New Zealand Government Association, and I'm trying to help them understand uh, how government can actually be using social media far more effectively to, to communicate policies. But that's a two-way street, getting information, crowdsourcing, getting information back from the communities to help formulate policy. I mean, this sounds, such, it sounds so normal, it sounds like common sense, but, you know, governments don't follow <coughs> A slow moving in this area. So I, I hope that I hope I answered your question. But I, you know, all of these technologies are part of the same beast. Mm. I'll, I'll just come in on the because you asked about the, on the political side. I've, I've worked with with Joe on a, num a number of campaigns, and um, <laughs> I think what's interesting now is it, it, it isn't just it, it's not just that people have a laptop and they and they tweet at each other, but as you as you're alluding to, they now have the tools too. So if we do, when we do political campaigns, people submit ideas for political ads that they've come up with, and they're really good, you know, because you, if, you've got a, if you've got a Mac now, you can edit together a 30 second spot, and you're cutting out those kind of, the, the, the sort of professional class of um, PR spivs that somebody alluded to earlier on, because the crowd is always going to have more more wisdom, if you like, than, than one very highly paid <coughs> corporate affairs person. Um, and that, the, the, the best example I can think of off the top of my head is, is Mohamed Bouazizi, who is the Tunisian fruit seller who un, unwittingly propagated the whole Arab Spring. Somebody um, had took it upon themselves because, of course, the traditional media was state controlled. It went viral on, on Twitter with videos, and a week later, 5,000 people came to his funeral. Um, there's a, a better example, a more cheerful example from uh, from from Trippies would be uh, Good Luck Jonathan, who has, who's the, who has something like three million uh, Twitter followers. And people, there tends to be sort of su uh, suspicion around, you know, is, is, is Julia Gillard really doing her tweets, or Tony Abbott really doing her tweets? And you can only really tell when the typos and spelling mistakes come in. But a year or so ago, <laughs> Good luck, Jonathan responded to a tweet uh, saying, why doesn't Nigeria have a trade commission in San Francisco? We're doing all this high-tech business. We should, have a, we should have a trade commission in San Francisco. He responded, good idea, we should do this. And three days later, 
the Trade Commission in San Francisco is open, all of a sudden it was deluge. Because people realize this is the president's actually using this thing. So he's not going to take all the ideas, but when you realize that you've got an authentic, truthful voice at the other end, that's the democratizing effect, that's the empowering effect. It's not, um, it's not a sort of woolly pie in the sky sort of thing. No, I, look, if I can just, from a purely commercial perspective, I used to run for some years for my sins the largest advertising agency group in the country. And I made a radical suggestion at one point long before the internet, that the entire creative department should be replaced by people, young people who just, we got in for nothing, who just come up with great ideas. What Nick is saying is absolutely true. The tools now to, that people have at their disposal to come up with original bright ideas is there. If I was still running an advertising agency today, I wouldn't have a creative department at all. I wouldn't have one. I'd be relying on crowdsourcing. And, and the techniques that are now available to people. So it's just conservatism that's holding business back in lots of ways, as it does other things. Good, it's a great question, Colin. I, I think, um, look, there's a couple of things going on in the media world that don't, that don't see the light of day often. First of all, Fairfax has been a, a a very, 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 very bad one. I mean, a really bad one. I mean, when you have a board, and, and I've known a lot of these people sometimes in its various iterations, that knows nothing about about media, that is not involved in media in any way, shape, or form. I mean, I don't know how many people saw the Eric Beecher interview um, a couple of weeks ago. Beecher was the editor of the Age. He was asked by the Board of Fairfax 10 years ago to provide the board with an evaluation of the impact of the internet on their print media business. And he gave them a pretty good, he spent a lot of time on it. And, um, and as he said now, he underestimated the impact by around 50%. <clears throat> but he made the presentation to the board and uh, there was silence until one board member stood up uh, who had in his hand a copy of the Saturday Sydney Morning Herald, very thick at that point, he slammed it down the table. He said he never wanted to hear anybody come into that room again and tell the board that all of this advertising, all of this was not going to happen. And when asked who that board member was, he said it was Roger Corbett. Now the chairman. So, you know, this is a dysfunctional company. It has individually great journalists, um, but it has very, very poor practices. It's made very poor uh, investment decisions when it's come to the internet. Um, Murdoch, on the other hand, uh, has made some very good decisions and he's made some bad ones too. He bought MySpace for $540 million and sold it for 20. I mean, it was a disaster. Facebook came in, took it over, took over. Uh, so he got that wrong, but he's got a lot of other things right. And what he does have is a dispersed media empire that has television in the form of Fox. It's got movies. It's got a lot of other things going for it apart from newspapers. And it is pretty well known inside the Murdoch world that those other enterprises prop up the newspapers. So, and Murdoch loves newspapers. You know, he loves them. It's in his blood, so he really gets it. And I think that passion comes through. From a commercial point of view, they are also far more successful as advertising vehicles than the Fairfax papers. So you've got this other problem going on too. So what I alluded to before about the presentation of audience in mass media, how, you know, the, the model, the revenue model for newspapers and mass media advertising generally is fundamentally flawed now. And that's what they're all grappling with. It's how do they get that commercial model right? How do they actually put the bridge in place between the old traditional revenue model that they had and this new model that they don't quite know, they don't understand. Is it going to be subscription-based? 
Is it going to be advertising based? They don't know. So they're experimenting. But Murdoch has the ability to experiment because he's got other very uh, highly profitable vehicles in his stable that can sustain, sustain the operation. Fairfax doesn't have that. It is quite possible that in three to four years' time, you will not buy a physical copy of the Sydney Morning Herald. You will not buy a physical copy of the financial review. That is quite likely. Think that, that is how bad things have gotten so. Look, I think government can play a larger role, but it's a matter of will. I mean, I, I won't name the department, but I met with uh, a large New South Wales department, Director General level, with a couple of heads of other acolytes uh, last week. Um, they have been given a rev up by a new minister to actually do something <laughs> in this space. Uh, and as they said to me, uh, gee whiz, you know, what we normally take four years to do, we've been asked to do in six months. And you go, mm hmm <laughs> They're already eight years behind the show. So it really is a matter of will. I mean, government has the resources, obviously, and there's an enormous number of bright people in government. I mean, I've met some fantastic people in government that are trying to steer government towards the usage of social media uh, for transparency reasons, for policy reasons, for communication reasons with, with the end users, particularly on frontline services like police, like you know, the, the RTA, a whole range of But, you know, the, the inertia of the bureaucracy is something that can only, in my view, be driven down from, from the top down. It's really up to the politicians, unfortunately, to be the pace setters in this area. And I think there's enormous kudos in, in it for them if they, if they do that. Um, but they've just got to have the will and, and I guess, being politicians, the understanding that their votes may go up uh, if they do something positive.